Well, amen and praise the name of Jesus. What a tremendous, tremendous opportunity is given to you and I as the people of God. Yeah, to celebrate. Yeah, celebrate good times because our God is good. That's right, all the time. And all the time, God is good. Well, we don't have anything to do but celebrate because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When you look at uh, professional football, you see them now, they'll run up to that large screen and pose and do all that. Uh, does anybody remember where they say that all started? It started with Billy White Shoes Johnson. Go ahead, Google it. As far as they can trace it, he's the first one that started celebrating after he made a touchdown. And they said to him, Billy, 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 why do you do that? Why do you celebrate? Here's what he said. He said, look, when I make a touchdown, it's the culmination of what has gone on all week in preparation for my celebration. He said, I've done two a days. That's two, two practices a day. I've watched game film and all kinds of things. And so whenever things come together and I cross the finish line, I just celebrate. He would celebrate like this. I just celebrate because it's the culmination of everything I've gone through through the week. I survived it. I utilized it. And now I step over that goal and I got to celebrate. I don't know about you, but it's been rough. It was a it was a rough year. It's been a rough week. It was a rough day yesterday, but I made it. I'm here and I'm able to celebrate what God has done. He has brought me through the valley of the shadow. Is there anybody out there uh, that wants to celebrate uh, what God has done for you? It hasn't gone like you wanted to go, but you're still here. You didn't get what you wanted to get, but you're still here. You didn't get as much money as you needed, but you're still here. You may be sick in your body, but you're still here. You may be watching from a prison cell or listening on a radio from a prison cell, but you're still here. And so we can celebrate. We can praise God. We can glorify Him. Why? Because I'm still here. God has brought me through. He's made a way out of nowhere. Somebody ought to be thanking Him because you had a rough week. You had a rough year, but oh, weeping may endure for a night, but joy, 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 joy comes in the morning, the joy of the Lord is my strength, so I'm going to celebrate in spite of, because God has been good, he's made me more than a conqueror, hallelujah. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Yeah, everything is torn up from the floor. Up. But come on, come on, come on. Then let's give him, let's give him some praise. Come on, get your shout on. Come on. You made it. May not feel like you want to feel, but you made it. May not have what you want to have, but you made it. Can you just celebrate the fact that you are on top of the ground and the ground ain't on top of you? Well, it's a good day. Can you celebrate that when you pulled your right foot out of the bed, the left foot automatically followed? Celebrate. You put your own clothes on. Celebrate. You fed yourself this morning. Celebrate. You're walking under your own power. Give him some glory. Hallelujah. I gotta, I gotta get it out. I gotta, yeah. I gotta pray. I gotta pray. Do you gotta shout? Come on, I gotta shout. I, I gotta shout. And I got to get it out. I gotta shout. Now you don't 
know what I like to do, but you know what I like to do, you know what I like to do. I, I like that little part where you go, huh? about you but I feel more better now not more better blues more better joy yeah hallelujah uh, well last week we looked at Hebrews I don't see why we ought to leave oh we were we were doing Wednesday night Bible study from there we're gonna leave it we're gonna go to the Ephesians chapter 3 20 and 21 as we prepare to continue in a new year, we start off with our foundation, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 9. No other foundation can be laid other than has been laid, Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I hope you'll do today. Take the limits off of God. Hmm. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, you know it, and now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to his mighty working power in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We thank you because ultimately we will be in your presence. Immediately we have experienced your power. Subsequently, we ask you to continue. Minister to us, we pray. Help us to comprehend what your word has to say. Somebody's going through right now and they've lost a loved one. Would you be the God of all comfort? Somebody else has lost a job. Would you be Jehovah Jireh? Someone else is sick in their body. Would you be Jehovah Rapha? In other words, be who you revealed yourself to be. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus the Christ. And everybody that loves him said, Amen. It was around 1985. Uh, my precious sugar babe had been having female issues. She had had several surgeries prior to coming to Chicago. We found out later that the doctor had used her to make money and what he should have done completely, he did partial and piecemeal so that he could have several operations and get paid for them. So when we came here and she started having the problems, we wanted someone that would be able to minister to her. And so one person said to me, the best doctor in that field is in LaGrange Hospital. His name is Dr. Anderson. But he may not be able to get to you guys because he's got a long waiting list. I said, well, you know, I got Jesus on my side. And sure enough, guess what? He said, uh, bring your wife in. We'll take a look at her, and uh, he put us on his list. That's called favor. Favor ain't fair, but it sure is fabulous. We went through all of the preliminary stages. She needed the surgery. He set her up for the surgery. Now, we had given our insurance card and everything, uh, but to our dismay, our church failed to pay our health insurance policy. And unbeknownst to us and to the hospital and the doctors, it had lapsed. You should have seen the consternation when I received the bill. It was over 
$200,000. Now, I've got to, I've got to put it in, 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 in perspective because at that time, remember, I was only making $100 a week with a family of five and was being charged $100 to live in the parsonage. So a bill that's over $200,000, you figure it out. If I paid $100 a month, it, that's what? 200 months to pay that off. I began to go to prayer, and this was my passage. I said, Lord, you said that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that Pastor Ford and his family can ask or think. According to your mighty working power, I don't know what you're going to do, but you make a way out of no way. Lord, help us. And so you know how the bills come in. They come in in red. And so we go to the hospital for uh, after surgery checkup, and they give us the bill. I said, you mailed it to us. They said, no, you need to see this one. I opened it up, and it was over $200,000. Now, that's back in 85. You know that would be close to a million dollars in today's currency? And so I opened it up, and here's what it said. It had the amount. It was over $200,000. I don't remember exactly. I know it was over $200,000. And it said, paid in full. <laughs> Woo! Oh, yeah. Yeah, paid in full. See, Dr. Anderson was a believer and he was listening to me on Moody Radio. I didn't know it. That's why he invited us to come in because he was listening and he loved the preaching. And so he made room for us because the Lord will make a way somehow. And because he was a believer and I was a believer and he loved the word of God, Dr. Anderson, who performed the surgery, paid the bill. The anesthesiologist costs. Dr. Anderson paid the bill. Yeah, yeah. The charge from the other doctors that worked on my wife's case. Dr. Anderson paid the bill. Yeah, the two-week hospital stay. Dr. Anderson paid the bill. All of the medicine while recuperating. Dr. Anderson paid the bill. And all the follow-up costs. Dr. Anderson paid the bill. I said, praise God, because you did it. You are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to your mighty working power in us. But Dr. Anderson's not the only one who paid the bill. The great physician, Dr. Jesus Christ, he paid the debt he didn't owe because we had a debt we couldn't pay. Yeah, Jesus paid it all. He had to pay for with his blood you know it Leviticus 17 11 God says I've given the blood on the altar as atonement for sin Hebrews 9 22 B without the shedding of blood there is no remission now not just Lottie Dottie and any old body's blood it had to be perfect blood it couldn't be Adam's blood uh, because uh, he had a sin nature and everybody knows that the bloodline is passed down from the father to the child so in Adam 1 Corinthians 15 22 a all died but in Jesus Christ all are made alive so God sent Jesus the last Adam to take the place of the first Adam. He was virgin born, conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's why the songwriter said, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. And let me tell you the difference. See, the first Adam, he died with his bride. But the second Adam, the last Adam, Jesus, he died for his bride. See, the first Adam had blood shed for him, but the last Adam shed his blood for us. Yeah, see, the first Adam broke us up with God, but the last Adam fixed us up for God. 
Yeah, yeah, oh, you ain't going to pray with me, but I'm going to work it anyway. The last Adam, uh, he, 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 he caused our separation from God. But the last Adam, he caused our reconciliation to God. So the first Adam, he ate from a tree and bought us death. But the last Adam died on a tree and brought us life. So when you look at it, because of the first Adam, we have separation from God. But because of the last Adam, we have justification with God. So then the, la the first Adam, the process of putting us out started in a garden called Eden. But the last Adam, the process of bringing us back in started in a garden called Gethsemane. Yeah, we think that it was a lamb that God slayed to cover the first Adam. We know it was the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, the last Adam. So the first Adam gave us a hopeless end, but the last Adam gave us an endless hope. And so what, we, what do we need to do? Man, we need to take the limits off of God. Now let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. Bring that camera on over here. Let me show you what I mean. You need to understand sometimes, not all the time, sometimes you wonder why somebody else gets something and you're both believers. Uh, well, 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 it could be this. I'm not saying it's every time. But, but what God does, remember what he said, according to your faith. So you got to believe what he has said. I believed and my wife believed what God was going to say. Uh, what God said he would do exceedingly abundantly above all. Well, what did we ask? Well, I just asked that the surgery bill be paid. He paid the whole ticket above that that. He honored our faith and trust in him. Now, you got to understand this represents your capacity. Here it is. If this is the size of your faith, what God will do is God will come and God will say, all right, be it to you according to your faith. So then he fills you up to capacity and God is a good steward. And so once you reach your capacity, that's all God can do for you because you have reached the capacity and God's a good steward. He's not going to waste stuff, you know? And so now you got somebody else who has more faith and God says, all right, I will fill you up to your capacity. And so you, you have faith to believe for this, but they have faith to believe for this. But then there's somebody else with a bigger faith and trust in God who believes they're able, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly. And what happens? They have more capacity, so therefore, they get more favor, they get more provision, they get more peace, they get more power, and then you have some people who have great capacity, who have great faith, and you're wondering, why do they walk around with a pocket full of money, driving what they can't afford? And because they believe God, and he made a way out of no way, that he did exceedingly, abundantly above all that they could ask or or think and uh, look what he did he filled them up to capacity but you say well what's going on now listen if somebody else comes on you don't have to worry about it why because he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all uh, that we ever ask him to do God has an ocean of blessings and all we have is a thimble of faith some Somebody better help me out here. You know what I'm talking about. Because your faith used to be like this. But then it grew. And when it grew, your capacity grew. And then you, you grew. Uh, how do you grow? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And you grew. And your capacity grew. And you grew. And your capacity grew. And there are those of us that are out here. We have exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think according to his mighty working power. Somebody want to shout, go on, give some, give some, give some, give some. If you can't relate, don't part 
participate. But if you can't relate, you ought to celebrate that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly. You got to take the limit off of God. 2 Kings 13, 18 and 19, let me just share it with you real quick. Here's what happened. The prophet comes to the king and he says, God says he's going to defeat your enemies. So here's what I want you to do. Take that quiver of arrows and shoot some arrows. You read it for yourself. It's in 2 Kings 13, 18 through 19. The prophet got mad at him. He shot arrows. Then why are you getting mad? He obeyed. But he didn't fully obey. Here's what the prophet said. Why didn't you shoot the whole quiver? Why did you only shoot three? And here's what the prophet was telling them. That demonstrates your capacity and your expectation from God. You should have shot them all. Then he would have defeated all your enemies. But since you only shot three, you will only win three battles. Man, somebody's not winning the battle because you done put a limit on God. You done told God uh, that this is as far as he can go. It's amazing to me that even secular people, uh, they don't have Jesus. Their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, but guess what? They take the limits off of things. And you and I have got to take the limit off of God. Look at all that people miss because they refuse to break out the box and take the limits off. Oh, oh okay. Decca Records. They're not in existence anymore, I don't think. I don't know. But anyway, here's what they said. We don't like their songs. Plus, guitar music is on the way out. So they rejected the Beatles. <laughs> Atari was approached. Anybody remember Atari? Just a little thing of D, 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 D. Now you got to be a doggone magician. My, my grandson had me, you know, come on with my place. Man, I, oh man, I threw that thing down. I said, you won by default. I don't even know how to work these things. And Atari. So they came to Atari, and here's what they said We have an amazing thing. Even built with some of your parts. We want you to fund us. But even if you don't fund us, we'll come work for you if you pay us a salary. We just want to do this. And Atari said no to Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak about the personal computer. And they went on to build the most profitable company in the world, Apple. Apple, which is now worth over two trillion dollars. Two trillion, the first company to become a trillion dollar company in the world. So it's the first US company with more uh, uh, roll that back down because I want them to see, uh, you know, that when you look at uh, it's bigger than uh, it's bigger than Microsoft, which is 1.7 trillion. It's bigger than Amazon, which is 1.6 trillion. It's bigger than Google, which is 1.1 trillion, and it's bigger than Facebook, which is 761 billion. Wow. Wow. Take the limits off. Fred Smith had a term paper uh, as a student at Yale Business School. And uh, here's what the professor wrote on the paper. The concept is interesting and well-founded, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must also be feasible. So Fred Smith got a C on his business proposition paper, but he went on to found FedEx. Take the limits off, take the limits off, take the limits off. A cookie store is a bad idea. The market research says Americans like hard cookies, not soft ones like you make. So stated the man who turned down Debbie Field's business loan application. She went on to found Mrs. Field's cookies. Oh man, I like that, because I've never met 
a Mrs. Fields that I didn't like. Yeah. God can make the possible, impossible, possible. You guys had an idea, an approach blockbuster video. They're out of existence now. They flat out rejected their idea. So they went on to form Netflix. These people refused to let anyone put a limit on them. And I came to tell you that this second Sunday in the new year, we need to take the limits off of God. Now, there are two reasons why. I mean, there's four reasons why we need to take the limit off of God. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. God wants us to trust him to the point where we don't put any restrictions or limitations on what he's able to do in us, for us, to us, and through us. Let me say it again. God said, Quit putting me in a box. Take the limits off of me. I am not limited by what limits you. Now, there are four reasons why in the text, and I'll, I, I'll, I won't get to all of them, but let me tell you what they are. Here's what he says. He says, the first reason we ought to take the limit off God is because of his surpassing provisions for us. Second reason, his sure promise to us. Third reason, his superlative power in us. Here's the fourth reason, his sovereign providence around us. Wow. Now I want you to notice this. Notice, first of all, we ought to take the limits because of his surpassing provision for us. In other words, he's already given, come on, say it, put it in the chat. You know what I'm going to say, the best of heaven for the worst of earth. In other words, how then shall he not freely give us all things who have given unto us his son? He's already given us the greatest. So if he gave Jesus to die, what's a car? If he gave Jesus to die, what's clothes? If he gave Jesus to die, what's a healing? If he gave Jesus to die, what's a degree? If he gave Jesus to die, in other words, Paul is saying, man, look what he's already done. Wow. Now I got a question. What motivated Paul to give the benediction and then go on for three more chapters. Now you gotta ask yourself that question, why? Because this is a doxology, verse 20 and 21, and it's a benediction. So Benny Dictos, good sayings, you remember? What is it? The preacher's parting admonition to the people of God where he conveys a badge and a blessing. You know that. That's at the end. Well, wait a minute. He gives the benediction and then goes on for three more chapters. Look at Jude 24 and 25. How does it end? With a benediction. Now unto him who's able to present you before his presence with exceeding joy, the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, majesty, and power. That's at the end. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not unusual for Paul. Look at the book of Philippians. It's not unusual. Because if you look at the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. I'll wait. Listen to what he says. Uh, 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 verse uh, Chapter 3, I mean. Chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what he says. Finally, my brethren. Wait a minute, you're in chapter 3. And you said finally. And then he goes on for two more chapters. Verse 4, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? And then he goes on for more verses. In other words, I'm trying to make a point here. I need you to see uh, that Paul, is something's going on here. You know, one of our members, this has been a little while ago, brought her co-worker to church and was Catholic. 
had never been to a Baptist church before, had been Catholic all her life, and the member brought her and sat her up front. And she had told me, she said, Pastor, now she's going to want me to explain some of the things we're doing because they don't do it in her church. And I'm going to be talking, but we're not talking. I'm just sharing with her why we're doing what we do. So I had to laugh because there was a time, anybody been here long enough to know when I used to do this? When I got up to preach after I read the scripture, then I would take my watch off and I would sit my watch right up here. And the Catholic person asked my member, hey, he's taking his watch off and he set it on the pulpit. What does that mean? She said, honey, it don't mean a thing. It don't mean a doggone thing. <laughs> and you know what? Everybody knows she was right. <laughs> Everybody knows she was right. It didn't mean a thing. That's why I don't do it anymore. It got to be a habit. I did it about my first three years here. Uh, but I stopped doing it because it don't mean a thing. And uh, Pastor Lyles came up to me and said, people want to know when you're done. And I told them, don't listen to what he says. Watch what he does. And I said, what do you mean, watch what he does? He said, I guarantee you, once you close that Bible, you're done. He said, I sat here and I watch you. And you say, hey, yeah, I'm done. I'm about to let you go. I'm, on, I'm not going to be like Pharaoh. I'm going to let God's people go. And then I'll keep on preaching. He said, but every time you close that Bible, you shut your mouth. I said, I didn't even know that. But that's, I mean, don't we talk about it all the time? Warren Wiersbe said it best. When I open the Bible, God opens his mouth. When I close the Bible, God closes his mouth. When God is quiet, I should be too. <laughs> So why does Paul give a doxology now? Because he's overwhelmed. Have you ever been overwhelmed by the presence, the person, and the power of God? Remember, he's just awed by God. That's why he's giving a doxology and then going on for three more chapters. This is praise for what God has done, is doing, and will do. So if you look at the chapter, he deals with what God has done in the past. That's verses 1 through 12. He deals with what God has done in the present. That's verses 13 through 19. Uh, that's what God is doing. Then 20 and 21, that's the prophetic. That's what God will do for us. He, he's overwhelmed. Why would you be overwhelmed? Now get this. I, I can't talk about all of it, but get this. In chapter one, he's overwhelmed by the atonement. I ain't got time to explain a big $50 theological word. Go to Bible class. Chapter two, adoption. Chapter three, he's shouting over advancement. Chapter four, he's shouting over acknowledgement. Wow. Hmm. Now let me deal with just the adoption. Let me deal with the adoption. When you begin to look at adoption, now we studied it at Bible study. I'm going to drop them, not push them. Here's what you got when you were adopted. Paul took that from Rome, not from Jews. Romans did this. There were seven elements to a Roman adoption. Number one, you severed all legal and social ties to your natural family when you were adopted. Number two, you were placed permanently into your new family. Number three, all your previous debts and obligations are canceled like they never existed. Number four, full rights and privileges were yours. Everything the new family had, you had. Number five, you inherit the new father's title. 
Number six, you can never be disowned or disinherited. disinherited. Number seven, you need seven witnesses to confirm the adoption. Now get this, why is he shouting? Because we've been adopted in the beloved. We've been adopted. So, so what do you mean? Okay, think about it. Here's why Paul uh, was shouting. Because when you look at adoption, several all legal and social ties to a natural family, when you marry Jesus Christ, the devil had to sit down. He's no longer your daddy. You now cry, Abba, Father. You went from being a sinner to a saint. And so you never have to worry about being in the devil's family again. He can oppress you, but he can never possess you. Then you're permanently placed into your new family, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit have we all been baptized into one body and all of it been made to drink of that self-same spirit. All previous debts and and obligations are canceled like they never existed. Therefore, any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a, ki a kinos creature, new in existence, one that has had all of the past uh, 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 done away. So when the devil reminds you of where you were, you remind him of where he's going. Yeah, when he tells you what you used to be, you tell him it's used to be. Then you have the full rights and privileges of the new family. Let me summarize Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you have the full rights and privileges of the new family. Access to the word of God. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Name written in the Lamb's book of life. You inherit the Father's title. I'm a son like Jesus. I'm a king like Jesus. I'm a priest like Jesus. Everything thing that he is I am because he's the fullness of the Godhead body and I am complete in him which is the head of all principality and power he sandwiched my humanity between his deity and his sovereignty I'm all right because my identity is found in Christ I'm crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I said for me for me and you can never be disowned or disinherited you know what that means? I'm sealed with the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. And you had to have seven witnesses and that's the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 61 gives us six facets of this Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, he's called the Spirit of Truth. Seven, God's number for perfection, made up of the number three, God, and the number four, world. So seven is God in the world. Perfection. Hmm. Boy, I tell you, the late Dr. D.E. King of the, of the Monumental Baptist Church right here in Chi-Town told of the graduation that took place of a Cynthia Farthing. When the, the, the place was filled and the graduates were lined up, the man got up and he said, please, we ask you to restrain yourself. Give no applause until all names are called. He said he knew she was a grandma because he knew her story. Her daughter's husband abandoned his wife and child when the child was two years old. And grandma had to drive Miss Daisy. She scrubbed floors and washed clothes and clean houses. She stored money in jars and then in her bosom bank and paid for her granddaughter's education, college education. 
He said, it's quiet. They haven't called any names yet. He said, but grandma just broke out. Nobody but you, Jesus. Nobody but you, Jesus. Thank you. Nobody but you, Jesus. And, and, and Dr. King, uh, uh, D.E. King said, he said, let her alone. She's thinking about the goodness of Jesus. He said, but then something happened because a grandmother over here said, yes. Her parents were on drugs. Nobody but you, Jesus. He said, then there was a fire, a conflagration. People start standing up all over the congregation in this community, I mean, uh, celebration, graduation celebration. And they all start mimicking this old grandmother. Nobody but you, Jesus. Then he said, there was a cacophony of sound. And the only words that you can hear is, nobody but you, Jesus. Then somebody start running, nobody but you, Jesus. Then somebody start shouting, nobody but you, Jesus. And before anybody walked the stage to get their undergraduate degree, diploma, the place was in an uproar. Nobody but you, Jesus. In other words, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, here it is. Put it, put it in the chat. When I think, I thank. When I think, I thank. All right, right now what I want you to do is in that chat, we're going to fill it up. I want you to think, then I want you to thank. I want you to think what God has done for you. And then I want you to thank him. I want you to think about how he made a way out of no way. Then I want you to thank him. I want you to think about how God protected you on the Dan Ryan when you rode by that car that was just a little ahead of you. But it got them but didn't get you. When you think, you think. I want you to think there was somebody more qualified than you were. But you got the job when I think, I thank he paid your bills thank him he healed your body thank you he kept you sane when the folk around you were insane you gotta thank him oh look 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 you say you can't thank him you ought to thank him for the adoption God picked you wait a minute wait a minute God picked you. There were better church choices, but God still picked you. Oh yeah. We, there were smarter people, but God still picked you. There were more faithful people than you, but God still picked you. There are those who serve him better than you, but God still picked you. There's some that give more and give better, but God still picked you. God knew you would fail him, but God still picked you. He knew you would backslide and puff, puff, pass, puff, puff, pass, but he still picked you. He picked you. You, you know, you know uh, there's a song, though a million didn't make it, you're one of the ones that did. Where are the whinings when you need them? Yeah, he knew that you would fail him, but he still picked you. He knew that you would struggle to try to live for him, but he still picked you. He knew you would get a tune-up and get your swerve on every now and then, but he still picked you. He knew you and I wouldn't always have it together, but he still picked you and me. <laughs> I am somebody because of who died for me. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, John 15, 16, and they both say that I am somebody. He's so overwhelmed by all that God has done, is doing, and will do that he just breaks out in praise.
Yeah, he just breaks out in praise. I want you to see something here. I want you to see something here. Because he says, and now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you. I want you to see something about this praise. <laughs> I want you to see, first of all, it's spontaneous praise. See, see, look at it. He just breaks out. He, if you look at it and you, you, you move that out, let me, let me read it to you. It says that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints was the width, length, depth, and height to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Then he just breaks out. He just breaks out in praise. I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling wherewith you were called. Yeah, natural flow. The, but he inserts this praise. It's spontaneous. Here's what I love about Paul. What do you love about him, Pastor Ford? He didn't need a preacher to fire him up. He didn't need a deacon to pray him up. He didn't need a choir to sing him up. He didn't need a band to fire him up. He didn't need a praise team to Stoke him up and he didn't need a friend to prop him up and he definitely didn't need an usher to wake him up. Right. It's not based on anything that he just received. Paul didn't get a, 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 a new chariot with 24 inch tires and wishbone chrome rims. With a Sony radio with a Bose speaker. No, it's spontaneous. Why? Just based on the fact he has God and God has him. Then it's circumstanceless. What do you mean by that? There, there's nothing there. Psalm 84, 11 and 12. Here's what it says. It says, Psalm 84, 11 and 12. We change that for me. But Psalm, Psalm 84, 11 and 12 says, God, I want you to teach me. Teach me your way. And then it says, I will bless the Lord. And guess what? There's nothing else there. Nothing else there. Wait a minute. What do you mean, Pastor Ford? I will bless the Lord because he did this for me. That's not there. I will bless the Lord because he answered my prayer. That's not there. He just says, I will bless the Lord. The need a catalyst other than who God is. Habakkuk did it too, didn't he? Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. He said, although the fig leaf shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail. And the fields shall find no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. Well, what else is there? That's an elaborate way of saying everything is gone. Nothing has worked out. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Notice, he didn't say, I will joy in my salvation that God has given me. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I wish I had time to talk about it. But do you have a yet praise? Yeah, I haven't been healed in my body yet. I will praise the Lord. I haven't gotten back to job yet. I will praise the Lord. Do you have a yet clause in your praise? then it's spoken praise it's spoken it's verbal okay I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on this but let me just say this Psalm 34 1 I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continue to be in my hand clap is that what it says oh it doesn't say that Okay, uh, 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 I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my nod. Oh, it doesn't say that, it doesn't say that? Okay, uh, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my shaking. No, 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 no. okay, okay. Uh, uh, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my meditation. No, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continue to be in my waving my hands. No, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. 
not see it. Yes. <laughs> it's a sure provision, but then it's specific. He says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we, I'll talk about that Lord willing next week, but it's specific. In other words, what are you thanking God for? God, I thank you. For what? Count your blessings. Name them one by one and see the mighty things our God has done. He's able to do his sure provision. You ought to know a Christ Bible. Look, let me just bring two examples out. Just two. We want to start Impact Ministries. Now, you remember when we started that years ago? We started Impact Ministries and uh, uh, it was started, two teachers wanted to uh, 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 what do you call that with the kids? Uh, we tutor the kids. They wanted to tutor the kids. Started with two kids on Tuesday afternoon. Two hours. Then more kids heard about it. More kids start coming. And we figured it out and come up with a game plan. We said we need $50,000 to start an after school program, Impact Ministry. You remember that? I know you remember it. I talk about it enough, don't I? I met with our powerful, faithful deacons at the time. They're all gone now. And they asked the question that nobody asks. Where's the money coming from? It's a good idea, but where's the money? You know my answer because I'm sarcastic and I'm a smart aleck. The money going to come where all money comes from. The Lord. He provides. Okay, well, Pastor, we'll see if he does. They called me out to the Quad Cities to do, uh, do a re re revival. Six churches. It's the first time an African American has spoken to all six of these churches. And uh, they said, we'll expect about 600 people. When we got there, there's only about 30. So I don't know it was because it's the first time an African American pre. All I know is there was only 30 people. He said, well, you know, don't be disappointed. I said, can I still make an appeal for Impact Ministries? He said, go ahead. I preached my little heart out. And then I shared the ministry of Impact Ministries, and they took up an offering. I think those 30 people gave something like eleven or $1,200. That was good. But then a little old lady came up to me afterward with an envelope and said, here's for your program. And it was a check. Now, whenever somebody gives me a check, I always put it in my suit jacket pocket. I wait until I get on the road and pull off the side to see what they gave me. And I pulled off to the side. I'm glad I pulled off to the side because it was a check for $50,000. I go to our bank and I say, I got this check but I want to make sure it's not going to bounce. They looked at it and they said, well, we can't tell you anything about what's in the account. I said, I know. I just want to know if I sign it and, and put it in, will I be able to cash it? They said, Pastor, we'll call the bank. The vice president, his sister, his, his sister is Sarita Triplett, so he was the vice president at the time. And so he called down there. He said, Pastor Ford, you could put three or four more zeros behind this and it would cash. I called an ad hoc meeting. I said, uh, I got a check for $50,000. They said, it ain't going to cash. I said, it is because I already checked it before I brought it to you. I wanted to say, no, 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 no. So I called the pastor. I said, man, you remember that little old lady? He said, oh, yeah. She comes to all of our stuff, but she's not a Christian. I said, what? She's not a Christian. I said, bro, she gave me a check for $50,000 to start our program. Do you know what he said? He said, wow, God must have touched her heart because she's never given us anything like that. 
now unto him who's able. The Rhema Center over there, come on, you remember how we got the Rhema Center? Started a women's ministry in the kitchen. Thought we'd have 10 women, it could hold about 15. First day, almost 30 women. Automatically, the women said, we need a bigger place. And that, garage, that, that gas station was burned out because an Arab man had shot a black man who had a cell phone, not a, not a, not a uh, gun. And they burned down this station and sat there. And you know the story, you remember it well. And I, and I, I said, I wonder if they would donate it to us. And so uh, uh, Sister Terry Cunningham called me. And she called me uh, from the place uh, that, that had it from BP Amico. And she said, hey, Pastor, how you doing? I said, hey, sis. She said, I'm at work here at BP. I said, you work at BP? She said, yeah, of course I do. I said, you know that property on the corner? Man, I'd like to see if we can get it. Because we had found out from our real estate agent they wanted 75000 for it. I said, see if they donated to us. Property was worth a quarter of a million. And uh, she said, okay, let me check it out. Call me back. Guess what? The, one, the woman who's over it is my boss. And she said, you can have it. It's going to take time to fill out the paperwork, but you can have it. And so what happened? You know the rest of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got the building. Quarter of a million dollar building donated to us. And then Ron Benier and his sons did the electrical work. And then uh, 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 a couple of our churches in our denomination, about 20 craftsmen took two weeks off and came and rehabbed the whole thing. And they did it pro bono. And Sister Brown from BP Amico gave us the first $25,000 to rehab. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. It makes me think, and I got I to close because your, your mind can only store what your seat can endure. You're already ready to go ahead and get your eat on. But, but the songwriter said it this way. I have so much, so much to thank God, to thank God for. I have so much, so much to thank God for. He made a way for me. He gives me vid Story. He opens doors for me. I'm not able to see so much to thank God for. Come on, let's close on that note. Come on, Willie. Try. Come on, Willie. Hit the, hit that for us. Hit that for us. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Right where you are. Right where you are. Yeah. Right where you are. Yeah. Come on. Come on, let's, let, let, let's close by thanking him. Come on, sing to the Lord. I have so much, so much to thank God, to thank God for. I have so much, so much to thank God for. He's made a way for me. He gives me victory. He opens doors for me. I'm not able to see so much to thank God for. Listen, take the limit, limits off of God going back to school. Take the limits off of God going to start that business even in the midst of a pandemic. Take the limits off of God. Take the limits off of God. He can bring your children back. He can bring your spouse back. Take the limits off of God. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to his mighty working power in us. Father God, thank you. for expanding our capacity today. Mm. There's somebody, Lord, that just put you in a box and was limiting you. 
And now they're breaking free. They're taking the limit off you. They now believe all things are possible with God. They now believe that nothing shall be impossible with God. They now believe there's nothing too hard for our God. Expand their capacity. If you're viewing this program, worshiping with us today, and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He is God in the flesh who died, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We invite you to invite Him into your life. Yes. Give your heart to Jesus. Hey, if you're watching and you're not a member of Christ Bible Church, you can be. Even if you're not in our city, you can become one of our internet congregation members. And so you've already given your heart to God. You can give your hand to this preacher. You can give your discipleship to this church. You can give your fellowship to the elders and the deacons. You can give your gifts to the body of Christ at Christ Bible Church. To minister to a hurting, helpless, homeless, and hopeless world. We need you. Many hands make light work. So we pray. If you want to get involved, you want to become a member, or if you've accepted Christ, go to our website and click connection and then let us know. It'd be our privilege to shepherd you. It'd be our privilege to see you Discover your gift, develop your gift, and deploy your gift for the glory of God. we got a lot of things to do. The vaccine's out. Some people are going to take it, some people aren't. But they say somewhere around beginning of April, beginning of May, maybe the beginning of June, we'll be able to come back. We've got everything prepared. And we need some new hands. There's some new ministries that have sprung up during COVID. And we need to begin training you for coming back. We're excited. We'll be glad to see you. I miss you. Seeing your face, your smile. Giving you a Christ Bible Church hug. You know what that is, where you, where you do like that. That's, that's Christ Bible Church. So we trust you'll join us on Wednesday night as we continue in a message on bitterness. If you didn't hear that, we had a glitch Wednesday night. Wasn't anybody's fault here. I don't know the technical term. All I know is it's the, it's the people who host us. Uh, but we're sending it out to you. And it's on our live stream and it's on YouTube. And you can go and let you need to listen to it. If you ever battle with bitterness, if you ever know somebody who battled with bitterness, you need to get them to see it. And so I trust that from this, there'll be those of you who will launch out into the deep to catch a drop of fish. And now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to his mighty working power in us. Be glory, dominion, majesty, and might both now and forevermore. And everybody that loves him said, Amen. Maranatha, our Lord is coming here, there, or in the air.